In a career spanning over seven decades, Miklos Roja composed over 100 film scores, including many legendary classics. He's been recognized with 17 nominations for Academy Awards, sometimes for multiple films in a single year, and has been a significant influence on many young film composers today. Roja also composed a great deal of serious music, a total of 45 works, including compositions for orchestra, marching bands, chamber ensembles, solo instruments, and choirs. His music has been performed by premier orchestras around the world, awarded two honorary doctorates from prestigious universities. Mikolos Roja is one of the most highly regarded composers in all of film history. Roja was born in Budapest in 1907. He spent his summers and holidays in a small town on his family's estate. The name of the town was Nojloch. And he used to go out there quite often and um, write down all the folk songs. Not the gypsies, but the folk songs the indigenous people had. Very early on, he started studying the music of his people, what we call Magyar music, like Kodai and Bartok did. And Throughout his 90 film scores and his orchestral works, the one thing that makes him different from all the other composers who wrote for the films is something that he holds uh, with Bartok and Kodai, which is this Magyar heart. There's a, there's, no matter what style, no matter what kind of storytelling, there's some part of him, the DNA of Miklos Rosha, that makes him unique as a Hungarian and as a Magyar. He may not have been aware of it at that time, but it was to affect his music considerably, all of it, whether he was writing for films or whether he was writing what he really wanted to write, his absolute music. One summer, his uncle was going to Paris, and he asked little Miklos, what would you like me to bring you back? And my father said, a violin, not a toy violin, a real violin. I think he was five or six when he started writing. Certainly by eight, he was already composing as any fledgling composer would. As a matter of fact, he even retained the first piece he ever wrote called The Student March. He still had it, as far as I know, up until the end of his life. His father actually wanted him to study chemistry. And when he graduated high school, they made a compromise that he could go to the University of Leipzig if he studied chemistry and music. He made such strides in music at the conservatory that his teacher, Hermann Grabner, wrote to Roja's father, if anyone has the right to be a composer, it is your son. And the great moment in the lab was that his stand partner apparently blew himself up, which made daddy feel that maybe it was safer to be a musician and that he could, uh, maybe, maybe he could buy into the musical idea. And so he gave up his chemistry studies and became a full-fledged musician. And at that time, he was also approached by the huge publishing house, Bright Coffin Hertel, and they bought two of his pieces when he was, I guess, age 24, 23. And um, it all started there. Before he scored his first film, his name was known all over Europe as a composer of concert works. Two of his most well-known works of that era are the three Hungarian sketches and the theme, variations, and finale. I had absolutely no intention to write film music. I knew nothing about films, and I wrote a ballet in 1935, uh, which was called Hungaria, and I had to go to London. And I read it in a paper that a French film director, whom I knew quite well from Paris, Jacques Feder, and uh, I gave him a ring, and he said, I'm so ha happy that you're here. He said, how soon can you be in my hotel? I said, well, how soon do you want me? He said, right away, because I'm in big troubles. So I got in a taxi and ran to his hotel, and we said, what's the matter? I said, well, I don't speak English, and my laundry, they don't understand me that I have to have my laundry done by tomorrow. I said, all right, well, I take care of this. And he was ever so grateful, and he said, now we will go out for dinner. I said, I'm sorry, I can't go for dinner. I have to go to my ballet. And he said, you have a ballet here? He said, yes. 
So we went to the ballet, and he was enchanted. And after that, he said, uh, now we are going to celebrate. We go to the nightclub. And he ordered champagne. I never drank champagne before. I intensely hated it. But uh, Federer did not hate it at all. And he was just starting the second bottle when he declared it that I'm the greatest composer ever lived. Well, what could I do? I bowed. So he went on. He said, well, you have to write the music for my next film. And I said, uh, look, uh, that's very kind of you, but I do not write foxtrots. See, I thought that, you know, in those old early films, whatever, there was somebody singing and dancing a foxtrot. Yes. I said, who, who the hell wants foxtrot? I want <laughs> serious music. I said, serious music in films? He said, yes. So anyway, I'll call you tomorrow morning. And I thought the whole thing was forgotten. Ten o'clock, uh, the telephone rang, and there was Jacques Federer, and he said, we expect you for lunch at one o'clock. So at one o'clock I was in his hotel, and finally about 2.30 a lady came with a gentleman, and they were introduced as Mr. and Mrs. Sieber. And I saw that the waiters are looking at us all the time, looking at me, I thought. I said, yes. now my ballet is in, I'm so famous, you know, everybody knows me and they know who I, I was. But of course, unfortunately, there was, they were looking at the lady. Suddenly the lady turned to me and said, is my song ready? I said, what song? She said, uh, well, Mr. Monsieur Feder just told me that you are going to write the music for our film. So I said, well, the song, of course, uh, well, it's not ready, but I'm working on it. <laughs> and so I turned in to, to Feder on my left, and very sotto voce in French, I told him, who, who is she? And he said, you idiot, Marlene Dietrich. And I looked at the lady, and she was. I saw the Blue Angel, you know, before, yeah. two, three years ago. And she was Marlene Dietrich, but she was also Mrs. Sieber, and that was Mr. Sieber, the husband there. So after that, he said, now, you just shut up from now and let me do everything. <laughs> and we went to the studio. He said, we are going to have tea with Vincent Cordo, who is an art director. I asked what an art director is. I had no idea. And when it was all finished, uh, Vincent Cordo, turned to me and said it in Hungarian. Are you Hungarian? And I said, yes. That's all we spoke during the whole thing. Then Feder said, now let me uh, talk to Alexander Cordo, as the managing director of London Films. Well, half an hour later he came back. He said, congratulations, you're engaged. I said, how? He said, well, I went into Cordo. I said, one for the music, I want Roja. And he said, who's Roja? He said, well, you don't know who is Roja. First of all, he has the biggest ballet in London. In, this is the best music I've ever heard. But this, he is also the best friend of your brother, Vincent. He said, they practically live together on the Montparnasse in Paris. And Alex said, well, if he's a friend of my brother, Vincent, take him. And that's how it started. In 1940, when Roja was working on the score for The Thief of Baghdad, a court of film, because of the war, Corder decided to move the company to California, and Roger went with them. And they arrived in the United States, and Father felt, well, I'll be here for about 40 days, we'll do the film, and I'll get back to England. However, he stayed for over 50 years. Roger was on the straight and narrow in the sense that he was not the idea of the temperamental composer, like Beethoven was, though Beethoven was actually his favorite composer with Prokofiev being his favorite 20th century composer. He was a very kind man, a real gentleman from the old school. He had manners, full-blown, inbred manners. I never once saw him get annoyed in the sense of throwing a tantrum. He was not a Toscanini. He didn't set out with the idea of developing his own particular distinctive style any more than he, than he set out with the idea of becoming a composer for films. It just happened, and it happened quite naturally. There were basically over 100 films, and in between all that, he was also able to write over 40 pieces for the concert hall. And there was one year, I remember in 1953, he had written five films and the, I think it was the piano concerto. No, it was the violin concerto. And he used to write notes on his cuffs, which mother uh, had to make sure she didn't put in the washing machine It would because it would be gone. He was totally obsessive about writing. Um, that's what he did from morning to night. He had a whole schedule. He'd get up every morning and have tea and toast. 
and then disappear down into a study, come up for lunch, and then usually take a, a rest in the afternoon, and then go down again until dinner. And then after dinner, he would either continue composing or would read poetry, history, things like that. He had a vast knowledge of history and art. The whole house was full of his Dutch paintings he collected, Roman heads, bronze statues. It was a museum, but it fitted him. He was a real Renaissance gentleman, and he wouldn't have fit anywhere else. The way he composed his music is a secret he never shared with anyone. Actually, he allowed his dog, Mowgli, which was named after Mowgli in Jungle Book. And that was his first dog of the dynasty. We had four boxers. His study was downstairs. And Mowgli was allowed to come in and sit under the uh, piano. I used to creep up and try, but he always discovered me and sent me out. But I'd go back, and Mowgli had a younger son called Fitzy, and he wasn't allowed up either. It was Mowgli's place to sit under the feet of his master. My, my first impression was, you know, being awestruck. I think it's clear to everyone who's listening to Ben Hur that they're listening to uh, the work of a master composer who has achieved the pinnacle of his craft. It doesn't sound like old score. It sounds like, uh, like today's score. To walk into the theater and to be confronted with this majestic music, which is actually from the film, you know, to sit down and eat your popcorn, and then, you know, the film starts, but you've already been exposed to the major themes of the movie. There is rebellion in the wind. It will be crushed. For any composer, you know, the real, um, the real grail is, is that, that wide canvas, the big epic story that can support a real contribution from a composer. The music for that film made it even greater than it was in the sense that it was grandiose and spectacular when you see it. But with the music, it creates that total link in the mind where the visual and the audio come together as one in your brain and you just sit back and you could feel the ancient world. You could just feel it in the music. First of all, we don't know how Roman music sounds. We have no idea. There's no documentation. We know how uh, Greek music sounds. Rosa uh, researched and found out that actually Roman culture got a lot of inspiration from, from Greek. So consequently, he thought that of, of course also in music. And I think it's very interesting, very detailed, deep research, which, who does it today? He had one year to, to do research, to prepare everything. That's a, that's a big thing. I had a ten, 10 weeks to score each of the Matrix movies, um, but that's the most time I've ever had for any film. The, the shortest amount of time I've had is two weeks. Miklos Rosa was absolutely the master, not commenting what we see, but go underneath. Uh, one thing I noticed uh, seeing the whole movie, he almost never scored emotional scene. Uh, Ben-Hur with uh, his mother and sister when they are sick. No, Judah, son, no. There's no music, it's quiet. And imagine today, today is a lot of situations when you have sweeping strings, that kind of emotional kind of things. We don't need it. Uh, the, the acting is so good, we don't need it. It's enough there. This is something we, we have to really learn from Rosa. He's following the story. He's following the and up and downs of, the, of uh, Judah's uh, life. Not commenting, oh, now it's, come, now it's falling down something here, so let's do some kind of crescendo. No, he's, he's not commenting, he's going underneath. It was a truly great movie and didn't really require music to make it great. And I think the best testament to that is that there's no music in any of the chariot race. The exclusive use of sound effects in the race allowed them to create a, a real point of view visceral experience for the audience because you're hearing the race as the charioteers hear the race. 
left with a suspense of not knowing exactly what's going to happen. There's a danger when you score an action sequence that you will shortcut the audience's conclusions about what's going to happen, that you give away what the audience really should just be there to discover in real time. I think you'd be hard pressed to find an action film made today in which the consensus was there should be no music in, in the major action set piece of the film. Um, more than likely not, today it would be a pop song. His score is very deep, very detailed. Miklos Roja was very astute in, in discovering what, what William Wyler and, and all the other directors that he worked with, uh, what that director was trying to communicate in a scene so that he could communicate along with him and not against him. There are a couple of places I, I remember which I really love the cow's uh, tonality uh, incorporated to the score, which I think is incredible. Mr. Weiler had in his head that he'd like the nativity scene to be scored with a 16th century Christmas hymn that he had heard. Dr. Roja was completely against that. And he said, well, that's 1,600 years after the first Christmas. We can't have that. And uh, Roja played for him the music he had composed. And Mr. Weiler said, this is beautiful. We'll keep it in. You know? <laughs> when we see musicians on the scene and they play trumpets and, uh, and percussions, and especially actually trumpet, different kind of trumpets, he uh, reconstructed some instruments. <laughs> Every time the, the Christ figure came on the screen, you never saw Christ's face, you never heard his voice. But we hear a certain type of music. Miklos Rosa used a pipe organ every time when we see Jesus Christ. And the only thing that, that tipped you off that it was Christ was that he had long hair and there was great music. The galley scene in which um, the character who knocked out the tempo for the rowers to row at. It was, a, a, I think, a pretty exciting scene when the military uh, fellow came down and said, okay, let's, let's see attack speed. Okay, let's see ramming speed. And noticeably, the pace got faster and, and more exciting because the audience could really feel these slaves becoming very, very fatigued at this, this really hard work. If you see the finished picture, you can see when he gets up to ramming speed, he starts bang, 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 and then as it goes, he starts to slow down a little bit, which was a big challenge for Rogia, because he didn't have the benefit that we have now of being able to fix the music after the fact. The music had to match the picture, but it wasn't an even beat. And uh, I think it's remarkable, looking at the film, how closely Roja not only matched the tempo of the man striking the blocks, but he managed to keep the intensity going in spite of the fact that the actors were actually slowing down. There are advantages and disadvantages to the way Miklos Roja worked as opposed to the way a composer would work today. What's really striking about the score is that, that there's, there's no reliance on technology or uh, you know, computerized click tracks or synthesized mock-up scores or anything of that sort. It's pure technique. It's, it's, it's pure craft. It's pure art. So when he was working, it was all in the abstract. You know, he could basically theorize, because you know, writing music on paper is, is somewhat of a theory whereas a modern-day composer might rely on his crutches a little too much. Roja had said that he won three Academy Awards and, and that Ben-Hur was the one he cherished the most. And I think that it's fair to say that it was his crowning achievement. And then afterwards, he became more active as a concert composer. I believe that John Williams has made a name for himself outside of, the, of Hollywood as being a remarkable composer. He may be the only um, orchestral composer that that the man on the street could could name, uh, but I think that that um, it's because of the legacy of people like Miklos Roja that John Williams can can carry on that legacy, and uh, other composers, you know, Jerry Goldsmith, James Horner, Randy Newman, uh, can continue the legacy that that the real pioneers like Miklos Roja brought to the craft.
What makes El Cid so totally cherishable is that we, we have this opportunity to reassess it again with the release of, of this new DVD and, and the restoration of the picture. And in many ways it hasn't been seen or embraced for so many years. And it allows us to look at it with a certain kind of uh, nostalgia of a time that was just coming to an end. I mean, no one knew in 1961 that this was probably going to be the last of Roja's big epic scores and that it was going to be one of the last of the epic movies. The El Cid experience was a very positive one. Samuel Bronston offered him a house in Spain. The house, he said, had a perfect room for him to work in and that he composed the score in, with a kind of exhilaration. Roja went to Spain and he got to work with a man named Ramon Menendez Pidal. And Don Ramon was the world expert of what we call Spain now at the time of El Cid. And it was Pidal who showed Roja the way to go to the Cantigas de Santa Maria, the songs of the Holy Virgin. Father studied with him for about a month to really get the, the feel of what the Spanish cantigas and all the Spanish music at that time. Father always did that. He did a tremendous amount of research, no matter what film he was doing. He always felt that his music should reflect the period that the film was about. Your twin daughters are playing in the garden here. And what Roja did is he took these melodies, which theoretically Rodrigo, Ximen, all of these people might have heard, and wove them into his score. He manages to recreate our modern image of what it might have sounded like then by the basic elements coming from that time. And there's something thrilling uh, knowing that. I think that my father's work for El Cid, he regarded as a tone poem in a way, r rather than a musical score. Something like Debussy's Iberia or the uh, Ravel Symphony uh, Espanol. Certainly not like that music, but in the style, maybe, that, that uh, was how he regarded this, this work. In addition to composition, he was interested in studying musicology. Now, this really informs so much of, of, of El Cid and the way he approached composition. You have to think of this. He was German trained as a Magyar. So what is German trained? If you even read the stuff that, uh, that Roja has written or the lectures, uh, he made about film composition, he always starts with the word Wagner. Rodrigo Vivar, take up the gauntlet. Every one of the principal composers of Hollywood adhered to the principles set down by Richard Wagner, and that is a very simple process, which is that every major character or situation has its own theme. Still, a man on a horse can move only so fast. That's as true today with contemporary film scoring of epic films or dramatic films as it was in Roja's time, as it was with Wagner. If you take one scene, well, there are the two that I think about. One comes very early on in the picture. It's where you see Don Rodrigo, who becomes El Cid, forgive the Islamic leaders. As a result of that, one of them calls him El Cid. We call such a man El Cid. I, Mutamin, Emir of Saragossa, pledge eternal friendship to the Cid of Bivar and allegiance to his sovereign lord, King Ferdinand of Castile. Roja smartly gives us the theme of El Cid, which is different from Rodrigo's theme, even though it's the same man. But he's not sure yet what that means. So we hear that theme in the violas and the cellos, and it hasn't found its full bloom. Similarly, at the end of part one of this picture, a new theme is heard, which becomes the, the great ending of the picture. It's the idea of El Cid, the great warrior who is going to bring Spain together. And we don't know what this theme is going to be, but at the confusion at the end of part one, and Ximen is saying, but why, but why, why, why that we're happy must you go on and do this? You have no right to ask him. He has done enough. The Cid. This other theme is showing us what he's thinking of. He's seeing his future. We don't yet quite know. So again, Roja is telling us this story. He basically felt the music gave a new dimension to the emotion that the director was trying to express. 
He also felt that if the emotion could be expressed in music, fine. And if it couldn't, it would be expressed in a special effect. But he didn't want the two to go together. And he always had clashes about that. Roja was not terribly enchanted with the way the sound mix was executed on El Cid. He had had a previous negative experience very similar to this about 10 years earlier with Quo Vadis. All of this music had been written and very little of it could be heard. He was very independent and um, he had quite a few clashes because he was adamant about his music. He was also adamant about being consulted. If you're going to cut my music, please tell me. And um, what happened in El Cid, they didn't tell him. And he didn't see it until, um, I think, a premiere showing. That must have been pretty horrible. Yeah, he was very upset. And being Hungarian, he could get upset. <laughs> the score is something like two hours and 16 minutes of music. Think about that for a minute. And apparently some 23 minutes or so of, the, of that score was cut between the time that it was put in the picture and the picture was released. The first example of it, we see Ben Youssef, the Berber who wants to come out of Africa, cross Gibraltar, and cleanse not only the Muslims living there, but the Christians and conquer. What we hear is a drum beat. The prophet has commanded us to rule the world. And the drum beat is actually where music used to be that Roja had written. And then only when Ben Yusuf says, and when they are weak, we will conquer them. The music comes back up and we hear the theme of Ben Yusuf. And when they are weak and torn, I will sweep up from Africa. And thus the empire of the one God, the true God Allah. Allah is the one God. There's a use of wind, the sound of wind, of church bells, frequently that covered or replaced where there had been a score. Roja apparently, and understandably so, was pretty upset about having 20% of his score or 15% of his score taken out. And it would be really interesting to hear how those scenes play with Roja's music in. Uh, but there are many people who argue the other way, which was that times were changing and the wall-to-wall -wall scores were no longer needed. They were, they were heard as intrusive somehow. So this becomes an open debate even today. And I do think it is a kind of harbinger that the days of that kind of scoring where 90% where of a film was underscored, the days of Max Steiner and Waxman, and in, case, in this case Roja and Korngold were coming to an end. And as fate goes, by some reason, because over the years different tracks were lost, now the only track, the music track that exists is permanently married to the sound effect track. And even if you go back to the deepest archives, you can only find a music track that has the sound effects on it. During the making of El Cid, a bombshell burst. Roja said that Bronston came to him with a favor to ask. Bronston had got um, monies from the Italians, and they would only supply the money if one of their composers got credit on the film. The Italian composer's name would appear on the Italian prints only, and that the Italian composer whose name appeared on the prints was to make no claims to royalties. My father felt, well, Brownstein has been so generous to us, go ahead, put credit, as long as I get the royalties, I don't care if there's somebody sharing credit with me. Roja, unlike some film composers, kept an equal life going on in the concert hall as well as for the cinema. He took half the year each year to write overtures, violin concertos, concerto of various kinds, symphonic works. And when he wrote words about music, he said that the difference is that with film music, it has to be understood immediately by the audience. They have a lot to look at and listen to. Um, but when you're doing symphonic music, you can be more complex. His double life extended by design even to his personal life. He would compose his film scores in Hollywood. He would take off every summer and go to Santa Margherita on the Ligurian coast of Italy, where he had not a villa, as one might think, but a small three-room cottage. He never wrote any film music there, 
And this was his intention. He wanted to keep his two separate lives separate and distinct. And I think he succeeded very admirably. There is a school of thought that he actually wrote his best music when he was being simple. You could argue the same thing is true of, say, Leonard Bernstein, that when he was not thinking about being a serious composer and just writing for the theater, writing West Side Story, that West Side Story is the masterpiece because he was simply writing a drama for Broadway. He was not thinking about, now, will people take me seriously or not? And whether this is Roja's greatest music, and he did look at El Cid as his last great score. There's no question he said that. He, in retrospect, he realized that it was his last great score. Um, that this, in fact, was the world he should have worked in, and he did work in, and that he triumphed in. Roja would want to be remembered, I believe, as a composer, not as a film composer, not as a Hollywood composer, but as a composer, pure and simple. And even after his stroke, he wrote pieces for um, one instrument, one instrument, um, a guitar sonata, a clarinet sonata. He never stopped composing. It was just, it was there all the time. What I did in the summer of 1992 was I, I played the, the, the Parade of the Chariots on the stage of the Hollywood Bowl. It was a great American concert. In the, in historically, great American concerts at the Bowl, John Philip Sousa, Appalachian Spring, and I wanted to do a concert to celebrate uh, emigre, refugees, the, the, the melting pot of America. And so I played this piece by Miklos Roja, um, but what I did was I had a telephone on the stage, and his nurse and I had worked out this this deal where he was listening on the telephone. And I, I said to the audience, I had never met him, and I said, Dr. Roja, I got on the phone, and I told the audience what, what we had just done, and I said, Dr. Roja, uh, this is John Cherry from the Hollywood Bowl. I'm here with 18,000 of your friends who want to wish you a happy birthday. And I held the phone out. I didn't plan to do it. I just held the phone out. And the audience just erupted. It just erupted, and, and the cheering that went on. And I said, we'd like to play you one more thing, and we played the love theme from Ben-Hur. Uh, and the only thing I heard on the other end of the phone was a very weak, bravo, from him. So I knew I had to meet him. So I went to his house, and it was Tony Thomas, his friend, and a biographer, and a man who, was written, who wrote a lot about film scores. He, he, he was with me, and he helped me, because it was hard to understand him, because his, his accent plus the stroke made it hard. And I said to him, I always touched him on the arm when I spoke to him, and I said, you know, Dr. Roja, people hear your music. There's people in the world listening to Spellbound and Ben-Hur right now. In fact, I imagine people hear Roja before they hear Beethoven. And he didn't move, but he said, also, very good composer. And, and, and he was just completely... Funny. I mean, this this kind of wit was there, and I remember saying, "How do I say goodbye to you in 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 uh, Hungarian?" He said, "A bientôt," because he spent those first years composing in France, and of course, he spoke French, and he was a very international man. So I had I I decided that we really had to get him to hear his music live, and it took a bit of doing, but but we were recording Madame Bovary with the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra in Sony, uh, which was the which was the MGM studios where he had been head of, of, of serious music. And at first, Tony said, I, I cannot ask Dr. Roja to come out of the house. It's too dangerous. He doesn't leave his house. I said, Tony, ask him. He'll hear a 96-piece orchestra playing this music that he recorded in 1949 in the same room. And what could happen to him? That, that he dies as a result of hearing his music? His life is, is what his life is right now, and he, uh, this might give him another three or four years. I said, why don't you just ask him? And Roja said yes. And so we worked out a deal with his nurse and his housekeeper and with the people at, at, at Sony that Dr. Roja would come on the, on the set again. And I had worked out that we had rehearsed it once and recorded the, the Bo Bovary Waltz. And, uh, and he came in and we, we did a playback. And it was amazing. He sat there in his wheelchair. We played it for him. And, uh, and there was this moment, and I said, uh, is that all right? And he said, the tam-tam is a little loud. I said, well, we can fix that. So by this point, the orchestra was back. And uh, I said, do you want, would you like to go sit here, hear the sessions here or in the big room? He said, the big room. 
And you know, I, I, I don't want to imitate him in a bad way, but I cannot forget the energy it took him to speak and that accent he had. It's, you know, it's completely in my brain now. So we wheeled him into the big sound stage, into the scoring stage of MGM, which is a big brown room. It has absolutely no uh, architectural beauty to it at all. That what it has is that it has not been changed, not since Judy Garland recorded Over the Rainbow, not since Ben-Hur was recorded, all of that, it's there, it's just the same, acoustically fantastic room. And Roja, who had lost most muscu muscular control, except for a little bit of his right hand, had a white handkerchief, which he waved to the orchestra and everybody applauded for him. So we recorded the, the Madame Bovary Waltz, and, and I went to him again, I touched his arm and I said, Dr. Roja, uh, was that all right? And he said, the violas should play louder when they have the theme. So I, I, I went to the viola section. I said, you know, Dr. Roja wants you to play louder. He's still clearly an optimist, which of course, because everybody always tells viola jokes. So we did it again and I went up to him and I said, was that all right? And he said, perfect. So now that was already a, a great moment for us. And when he was being taken home, I said, you know, Dr. Roja, we're, We'll, we'll play your music more. You should come out more and we'll play your music. He said, how about tomorrow? Just completely wondrous. Now I fast forward to when we, when we actually finished and brought, I brought it to his house and, uh, and I played it for him. And there it was edited and, and we, again it was tea and cookies and Tony Thomas was there. And after he heard it, he said nothing. And I was pretty sure that there was something really wrong and I, I didn't know what to do, I, what could you do? So I started to change the subject and suddenly he said, Tony, play the waltz of the maestro again. So we rerounded, I think it was on a cassette, um, and we played it again. And then there was silence and then he looked blankly toward me and he said, maestro, may I kiss you? And I leaned over to him and he kissed me. At my father's funeral, John Mauchery, with musicians from the Hollywood Bowl, they played Parade of the Charioteers from Ben-Hur, and that was the most incredible send-off. I mean, everybody was in tears. It was um, very moving. The last time I saw him was at his home in Hollywood in January of 1988. Tony Thomas was standing there. He was staying for dinner. I was about to leave. The three of us were in Roja's living room. I shook his hand and I said to him, I hope I'll see you soon. And he said to me, thank you for coming, Jeffrey. God bless you. I sensed that I wouldn't see him anymore. And uh, as things turns out, that's the way it was. He will probably be remembered more as a film composer than as a composer of concert works. But I can tell you how I will remember him. I will remember him as one of the finest men I ever met.